I think I think the the wonderful thing about about uh, the Napa Valley though is that it gets like many coastal areas, coastal valleys, is that it um, it it gets cold at night. So we had last night about a we'll have today between today and tonight about a forty degree temperature variation. So that diurnal temperature variation is does a couple of wonderful things. It just gives the vines just a just a little bit of a fresh cold breath um brings in a little you know dew um not too much and, and kind of gets them ready to go for it the next day but on a longitudinal basis just by being having this kind of temperature variation uh, that's one of the things that lets the vines hang on um for that long and the fruit hang time is what we say you know of course is is that is that is the um that's the best thing that the vines can do is to be able to stay on the vine long enough not so they're overripe i hate raisins raisins are for carrots <laughs> you've got plenty of time for the the maturity the phenolic factor to build up so that's the gusto in the wine that's that that's the point of of individuality that is so wonderful for so many, so many wines, so many grapes. So, um, so it works, it works quite well um, to have that kind of, that kind of information. So um, it's, uh, it is a, an amazing place to have been for all of these 41 years now that I've been here in the Valley. And uh, even despite some of the, the multiple traumas of <laughs> and earthquake and fi other fires, warehouse fires and, you know, drought and everything. It's uh, COVID, <laughs> but that's something that everybody is, you know, when it gets right down to it, it's really just farming. So um, uh, we get just a little bit more kudos for being great farmers, but I do a lot of farming, actually. I farm a little bit of a few pomegranates and lemons and we have an olive grove that was planted in the 1880s. And so um, it's, uh, there's a lot to do here besides just making wine, which is, but it's a wonderful thing. So, yeah. You are a certified organic, family run, female owned, dog friendly winery. That, that's a good way. <laughs> that's a great way of looking at the, at, at it here. Um, yeah, it, I think the dogs would say that they come first. I think we're, we're well known being a dog friendly winery. Actually, we, we joke and we say we're more, we're more wine bar with dog park or dog park with wine bar um, because uh, our dogs literally have to go to work every day or else they scratch at the door and and all of the wonderful people who work here kind of go well um you know do you want to go to work today and they're like yes let's go let's go it's great it's great, it's great fun yeah and you know i guess there aren't that many women who are sole owners of their of their properties so that feels pretty good although that's not the gender card is not the major thing that i play all the time because everybody's you know, I'm, I'm part of a group of, of winemakers with vineyard, with a winery who are at this point still small and trying to make a go of it. I mean, um, and staying small and staying small has been important to me. So um, it's, it's, an, it's, it's good to be in that, in that group. Um, I do think that it's not, again, not that gender related. They're, I think people need to be able to say that they bring a certain point of view to, um, to making wine, to tasting grapes, to deciding when to bring them in to make wine from them um, is really important, really. But what that's what we can do with the individuality. So that's what I do with the different labels that I, that I have. Um, you know, and when I was at Frog's Leap, I didn't have that latitude. We really... We, it was really a, a, an organization that was um, had a different viewpoint and the label and the, the logo were very consistent across the whole portfolio. But with my wines, with most of them being 
Some of them being as few as 94 cases, most of them being more 250 to 500 cases at the most. Um, there's, they're all sold individually, almost all out of here, a little bit in Arizona. And so um, it's, it's been, it's been absolutely, it's been absolutely wonderful to be able to, um, to figure it out and to make it work as a sole proprietor, as they say. And you were Napa's first certified organic winery in 1991, I believe. Well, we were actually uh, Napa's first certified organic vineyard. Mm -hmm. is, there, are, there are certifications for, and this is very confusing. The United States has made it terribly confusing. Um, there are two certifications, uh, national certifications. Um, one is for growing grapes, well, growing fruit, whatever. And the other is for actually the manufacturing and the processing. By, um, by law, the, the certification for wine making, the winery, it's not a winery certification, it's the product certification, um, has to be uh, devoid of a couple of very key processes. You cannot add any sulfur uh, to the wine at all, even though sulfur is naturally a natural byproduct of any fermentation, even in your orange juice, um, you know, that, that doesn't matter. Um, also adding any nutrient, um, you can't add any synthetic nutrient to the wine. So yeah, it's very, very prescribed and there's more to it than that. But so anyway, suffice it to say that I'm certified for my organic vineyard and we were by no means this particular property was by no means the first property to start working with organic um an organic philosophy um a progressive farming philosophy i mean uh, uh places like um yacht mill vineyards the hoxies um i think technically were the first to start practicing organic um organically, the Spotswood folks, the, the Sinsky, the folks at Sinsky, just for example, um, uh, Paradigm, um, uh, now Long Meadow Ranch, and of course, Frog's Leap, um, we started to encourage our growers, even though we didn't own land uh, for Frog's Leap for quite a while until we bought this particular property in 87, um, we were encouraging growers, we were giving them an, an extra stipend to follow the nascent at that point precepts of organic farming and growers did and we rewarded them and we got better fruit we always we always thought but when we bought this the this acreage in rutherford and we're on the we're on the western rutherford bench when we bought this this acreage we um we immediately took the steps to to turn it to write a, a an an organic systems plan, uh, organic farming plan. Um, and um, we did get the certification in early 91, end of, yeah, early 91. So uh, basically 87 through 90 were, was our probationary period. And then in early 91, we had the certification. So, and we've kept it up, I've kept it up ever since. And I'm glad that I have, there's so much more to it though um, now, but so, the basic tenets out in the viticultural space are that no synthetic materials are used. And boy, over the last 35, almost 40, well, 40 years, we've seen the development, the, the rapid fire development of, of um, management um, the materials for managing the health of a vineyard, managing the nutrition, managing the um, health when it comes to insects or other kinds of things. We've seen um, the materials available to us um, really expand and really get very, very sophisticated. And that's true in the cellar now as well. So we're, we're you know, well, I've been able to cut back my use of sulfur. I've been able to cut back my use of inputs. Um, across the board from the vineyard, from less use in the vineyard to less use in the cellar itself. So we're all progressing along that, that way. Um, 
So I'm very proud to keep that certification open. And now I'm working on my regenerative farming certification because if that's really more of what we do um, in that I think some of the um, organic systems uh, in place leaves a lot to be desired as far as what some of the goals are. Um, so the, the concept of partnering with and, and emulating native spaces is really important. The concept of developing um, a, a very respectful and thoughtful management plan with respect to what's to the soil complex, to the entire system is kind of what's missing. The, the, the whole plan, the whole picture, the, um, the reduction, the conservation of all sorts of elements and um, most specifically water, prevention of erosion. Um, those are all part of the OSP, but take another leap in terms of sophistication and goal setting uh, for, um, for, uh, for regenerative farming. Um, so the, the maintenance, the development and the maintenance of the microbiological, the bio, the biome, the diversity of the biome in the soil um, is, is really important. Um, we're working on minimizing our tillage um, and that makes you, puts you into the point of, of being ever more, your goal being carbon neutrality. Um, and so that's working. Um, our, um, we have long had animals here, We've long had sheep and like, I've, almost when I started Tracy Boris, I brought in sheep and guinea fowl and chickens. And so we, and mostly initially those were to uh, provide some wonderful opportunity here to compost all of the stems and seeds and skins that are a byproduct of harvest. So I didn't want to haul them down to the local processor. What I really wanted to do was use all the manure from the animals to make a really good compost that was usable. And so we've been doing that for all of this time and it goes back on the pomegranates and it goes on the and a little bit of it goes on the grapes. I mostly have to bring in organic compost for the for the grapes. It's just too much, even. But um, but then the, now the the whole focus. One of the points of focus for regenerative farming is to incorporate truly incorporate animals into the system year round. So we're working on not only spring, not only fall into spring grazing, but year round grazing. That's a big goal for us for this next year because there's so much to what a wisely managed uh, grazing program can accomplish in terms of offering uh, nitrogen sources to, to a vineyard. Um, it's, it's great. See, it's not enough just to have a nitrogen source, it's to have a nitrogen source that can be utilized by the plants. We're just starting to figure out that fascinating aspect. Really, what is the full, what, what encompasses uh, the holistic universe, the, the vital universe that's, that's in a vineyard? What is that? And why does it work? What's the communication between all of the, all of the fungi uh, that are in the soils and all of the other healthy organisms and their relationship to the roots? of the vines into the water in the soil. Um, we don't use irrigation in the majority of our vineyard. So um, there's a little bit on the hill that we irrigate, but everything else is farmed without irrigation. So it's really important that we get that whole regenerative system working. Um, and that's, that's the goal. So it's everything, you know, the bluebirds eat the insects, but we have cover crop that brings in the insects, but that cover crop gets laid down and becomes the mulching material for the vineyard. Um, all the carbon sequestration and all the nutrient development and all the water retention that happens with that. Uh, we have peripheral hedgerow plantings that every type of native plant and other flowering plants, perennials that we brought in. And for example, just the pomegranates alone. It's fascinating that the, the flowers bring in bees and hummingbirds. Um, bees are essential to the environment, uh, even though we don't 
even though vines are self-fertile now. Um, hummingbirds are essential because they're part insective, insectivore. So they really capture a whole strata of insects and help keep those things in balance. And then we make, we use the pomegranates for everything from pomegranate vinegar to brownies to um, pomegranate margaritas. <laughs> and, uh, and then for, you know, then we turn all of the waste from the pomegranate harvest into compost. So it all, it all circulates. And then besides that, pomegranates are just wonderful to have as part of one's farm culture. They're, they're symbolic of so much and they're healthy. So that adds other dimensions that are quite wonderful. You know, you were talking about it being warm today. That's pretty incredible that you can have dry farming. You can use the dry farming method there, on, especially on hot days. Are you worried about the future as far as climate change in your area? No, I think what, what a lot of people don't realize about climate change or global warming is that it's not so much, it is warming. We're certainly warmer here, but it's also more erratic uh, weather. And so our heat spells have become longer. When we have heat spells, they become more, they become incredibly stronger, like hotter, but they've also become more prolonged. Um, we have weather events and a drought is profound. This is the worst drought. Uh, when we have rain, we have intense, quite often intense rains, or we've had that. Um, dry farming is definitely returning, going going to the back to going back to the past to go to the future. Um, we have so many more tools to measure and monitor what's going on in the soil that that makes a difference as far as how we manage the canopy, manage the growing part of and also manage the crop load. Um, my hope is that, I mean, we got through last year's drought just fine, actually. Um, and I'm hoping that the vines, the relationship between the vines and the soil do it again, because they definitely take care of each other and they are the best plants, especially these wonderful, resilient plants, vines are, I mean, there's a reason that they've been around and been cultivated for 10,000 years, right? It's, we have found, and, and throughout all but about 50 of those 10,000 years, grapes were dry farmed and things, and they did just fine. Grapes are dry farmed in some of the most severe climate situations in the world, and they still do fine. So we're counting on that again to work. We really do believe, I really do believe that um, again, the relationship between the soil and the vine is incredibly important. Healthy soil makes great quality grapes that go through fermentation smoothly and taste really good in the bottle. But besides that, all of our different practices, how we shield the afternoon fr fruit from the, from the, um, from the sun, um, how we help sequester and retain water with all the mulching that we do um, with the cover crops. Those are all things that we can do to, and that we continue to do and, you know, keep our fingers crossed. This is, this is probably the most, one of the most dramatic tests that this vineyard will have had in the last 50 years, but this year with the drought, but we'll see. As I understand it, the roots on the vines go deeper. Is that- well, if you, sure, because if, I mean, they're set up, they're, they're um, you know, they're, they're pre-programmed to go pretty deep and, and they'll, they'll do, they do that naturally. If you, but like any opportunistic being, if you're given a point source of water, you're going to gravitate towards that. So I remember whole vineyards failing precisely because a phylloxera precisely because that drip zone was created more of a root ball and made that immediate area more vulnerable. And with dry farming, with the vines, you know, they don't only go deeper, but they go broader. So they really do have more opportunity to interact with all the mycelia, all of the fungal carpet, so to speak. It's almost like a, a carpet or a mattress because it's it has depth and and 
it has texture and it adds to the soil structure. So, so as it agglomerates the soil and it's that agglomerated soil is, is healthy soil. And so the more that we can do to, to advance that, um, the, you know, it's, it's really, it's exciting when you realize that the system is working. So it's not only going down, which they do do, but it's the ability, they, they go out and, and around and um, increase the opportunity to have the roots interact with microorganisms and with nutrients and to, to take up nutrients. And so um, we're very, so far so good. We're very happy with, I'll knock on wood for this year. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but it's not, you know, the vines, vines are pretty wonderful. They're not, the vineyard row is not covered with asphalt. It's, 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 it's permeable. It's, it's breeze. It, it's alive. It's fantastically alive. We received a commendation of some kind about just, they had done a bunch of testing to see what the diversity was in various vineyards along here. And we were, Trace of Boris was one of the top vineyards noted for this particular test at that particular time, but for the diversity of the organisms that was that were found. And there's a reason for that is because we've been doing this for a very long time. We can go down, we've had pits dug. You see worm casings five feet down. You know, it's, it's because we've been doing this this long. And and I really think it does help focus um, on the primary goal, which is making really good wine. And the age of some of your vines are 45 years or? or yeah, um, the Zinfandel was the, the most, the, the main part of the vineyard was planted in 1971. Um, so Zinfandel is still about eight acres and Cabernet Sauvignon, um, some of it is brand, you know, is planted over the last 20 years, but um, the majority that we have was grafted over from the Zinfandel vines. So um, it's, they've, They've been around. And then we're working with, in other areas, we're working with grapes like Sauvignon Blanc that are, um, that we're tasting today, um, that were planted um, back in the 90s. Um, that Sauvignon Blanc was planted as an originally designed to be a, a, a Pinot Noir vineyard. And then in 2004, the, uh, the viticulturalist butted over, grafted over the vine to Sauvignon Blanc because Pinot was just not working. And, uh, and the results have been quite marvelous. Um, so, and that is a, a minimal till uh, low input vineyard and it's not certified organic, but it is practicing organic. So it has a lot to do with the whole philosophy that we agree with and love um, to work with. So you have uh, about 35 acres and 13 acres planted with vines, as I understand it. And you said eight of those acres to Zinvindel. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and we've seen over the last century and a half of the rise and the demise of Zinfandel, unfortunately. Um, we have a two miles away from here, there's a there's a whole major road in the Napa Valley called Zinfandel Lane. And I don't know when that was named, but I mean, I, th I think it reflects, here we are in Rutherford, um, to the road that is the demarcation line between the St. Helena Appalachian to the north and the Rutherford Appalachian to the south. And, you know, I think it's apt that I think some of the best Zinfandel is grown in Rutherford. Um, it's perfectly climatically suited to, to Zinfandel. It gets warm cold nights, soils tend to be uh, rocky loam, gravelly loam, slight clay loam, I mean, with a lot of bench land and I'm on that bench land. So there's the drainage is fabulous. So everything that makes Rutherford great to grow, Zinfandel also makes it wonderful to grow Cabernet, which is of course the problem because then Cabernet has, in the thanks to Robert Mondavi and many other people have, has, has pushed um, a Cabernet to the fore to the result that going from almost well over the majority of the grapes grown in the Napa Valley being Zinfandel at one point in the past. Now Zinfandel is like not even, not even 3% of the grapes that are grown in the Napa Valley. So sad, but true. Um, 
but I still think that the Zinfandel grown grown here is is you know is quite marvelous, um, and um, I I plan to continue to grow Zinfandel. <laughs> I mean, I grow yes, I grow Cabernet Sauvignon. Of course, I grow Cabernet Sauvignon. It's it's Rutherford, of course. And, and I grow a, I grow Cabernet Sauvignon that I make into 100% Cabernet, and um, so it's and it's not I'm not sauvignoning it I, the juice I'm I'm it's it's 100% Cabernet, and so it has um, some of the classical notes that you might have found in Cabernets of of years gone by, and also where people I think are are moving again going to the future. My full belief is that alcohol can suppress the um, individuality and the, and the, not only the individuality of the grape, um, the identity, the varietal character of the grape, but it can mask um, the vitality that comes from drinking a nice glass and with food. Um, when you have a wine that has good acidity and not such a high alcohol, you really do want to enjoy both the wine and the food together. And that's what I that's what I love about Zinfandel. It's like drinking a whole cornucopia of sweet, savory spices and herbs and fruit. Are we gonna try some? <laughs> Are we going to? Yeah, let's do that. Are we gonna try? Do you want to try the Sauvignon Blanc first? So I'll pour you a little, I'll pour you a little. Okay. Bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so this is this is not Napa Valley fruit. This is again. Uh, Sonoma Mountain Fruit. Uh, the label is kind of fun for this. It comes from the original logo for Trace Boris that was a, a pre-Columbian bowl that I found in Ecuador in a museum and I had it, um, I took pictures and then I had it reproduced once I got back here by an artist named Pat Patricia Westman. And uh, I love the it just it fits in the idea of an organic vineyard very well because it has motion. And it has so many images that count, equinox, solstice, we think, a little bit of universal thing. Um, agriculture, rain, um, you know, elements of life. And uh, so that's the, that's the story of the label anyway. But the story of the wine is that it's grown at 700, 600 feet on Sonoma Mountain, on the northeast, a northeast facing um, site that has a very nice slope to it. So it's well drained, um, and it has a minerality that I define as uh, very cold stream water washing over uh, Sierra granite rock. Wow, you know, it's, that's that's very creative. <laughs> well, it has more to do with the difference between just like dis drinking distilled water and drinking a really delicious well water. I mean, it it's a it's a it's a very finite sort of a very particular sort of sort of difference but it there is something to that and it's not something that makes your teeth quite the quite the opposite it's, it's opulent it's it makes it like a pearl it's it's luminescent and i think without that verve without that luminescence maybe uh you know people say how do you, i always describe my sauvignon blanc as both smooth and crisp. And people say, how can that be? And I say, well, that's, that's, it's like, it's like a, a fine satin. It's, it's, it's smooth. It's beautiful. It has the, the fabric has to it. Um, but when you actually taste it or when you bounce on it, or when you, you know, flick at it or whatever, it's, 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 um, it's crisp. It's alive. It's, it's, oh, it's alive. All right. That's wonderful. It's, it's, it's joyful. Thank you. Well, it's, um, I actually spend a lot of time with this grape, but the, I only get 16 rows, which is about two acres of spotswood harvest, scolium project, um, uh, on the white keys. We all get this really precious fruit. We all stand out there, make sure we get every last tiny little cluster. The vines are not very vigorous. So, um, the clusters are small and uh, they get a lot of sunlight because there's not a big canopy. Usually Sauvignon Blanc is grown in uh, the more intense, the thicker, the denser, 
uh, soil that Cabernet doesn't like because it's not drained enough, it's, it's too intense. And I think that, that carries with it a certain stylistic way of, of Sauvignon Blanc expressing itself. On a hillside, Sauvignon Blanc expresses itself in a, a quite wondrous way, which is like this. Um, not the grapefruit, more um, tangelo, mandarin, lime, lemon, a more not even lemon lemon, more, more Meyer lemon. Um, I think it's got um, that tiny, wonderful little bit of pyrazine um, that makes it, you know, so the acidity brings in all sorts of pairing, pairing possibilities uh, with all of the saline uh, that's in fish, you know, and scallops and the depth, and yet the, the salinity and the freshness, it, it just works marvelously well together. Um, but it's also strong enough, it's also a big enough wine that can handle more intense seafood like crab, for example. I think lobster goes a little bit too far for this one, but, but it loves all of that fairly rich seafood, but it also loves things like Parmesan cheese. So it loves macaroni with three cheeses, you know, macaroni and fancy macaroni and cheese. It, it, it loves, it loves corn chowder. It loves, um, loves avocado toast. It loves pesto. It loves um, all sorts of, it lo loves all sorts of uh, wonderful things. So it loves uh, fish tacos, you know, with all with the little spicy sauce and and a lot of crunch with all of the vegetables or, or cabbage slaw or whatever is in is in it and it loves then the, the the wonderful character of seafood so it really brings it wine for all seasons and a wine for all seasonings is what we always used to have always said about solving was this vintage affected by the fires at all i know you had um, no we picked we picked this fruit before the fires um and be, you know, the, the, what would be called smoke taint, the fires, really the, the phenolic character that sequesters itself in the skins um, with fire taint, with smoke taint. It's all about sequestering itself in the skins. And so the first thing we do, this is all hand-picked. And the first thing that we do is to uh, put this in, well, we throw some dry ice in there and then we put this in the press for whatever the night, whole clusters in the press for like 90 minutes. And that's the only, you know, not much skin contact. And so um, we didn't, basically this is made without skins. And so it's, it's, it doesn't have a, a drop. And 2020, by the way, was destined to be uh, set up to be an absolute splendid year for growing grapes. The white wines that I make, I'm um, Sauvignon Blanc and Pickpool, of all things, a Southern Rhone white from the Sierra Nevada. Um, and uh, it's, and I make a rosé, which you may, you may, uh, you may think about it. Uh, this is the rosé. Um, you may call it a red wine or a white wine. I just call it a rosé. And so that, that also came in before, before the fires hit. So really, no, we've had a marvelous 2020 vintage. It was really, really quite lovely but do you get all that wonderful kind of mandarin but oh, stone yes apple honeysuckle uh yeah. nectarine i think with nectarine when i taste this yeah I, I definitely think of a white a really crisp white nectarine just you know at a farmer's market when you find that wonderful heirloom nectar white nectarine um just it's it's just worth going to the farmer's market for and sitting down and I make a, a, a summer salad with um, as, as bright a green, you know, greens as I can, but I put a little smoked trout and cut up some nectarine, white nectarines, and I might or might not add maybe some seeds or some nuts, but then a little feta cheese um, or a little shaved Parmesan on that. And then I, I make a, a very light fruity vinaigrette with our pomegranate vinegar, and uh, it's just as a an incredible match with uh, with a wine like this for all of those all of those reasons. The other thing Sauvignon Blanc, we're speaking of smoke. The other thing I Sauvignon Blanc does very well with is is something that's smoked. So a, a smoked meat, a smoke at, at Thanksgiving time, for example, a smoked turkey, a brine turkey, and smoked turkey is wonderful. Um, some of the things that happen with um, 
uh, with pork chops or things on the grill are wonderful. Um, I think some of the best combinations, I actually prefer rosé, our rosé anyway, with oysters, but I love grilled oysters with Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so I hope I make it, I'm, I'm making myself hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and you ate these wines for quite a long time, don't you? In barrel or in a variety of tanks, I probably, I pulled this together from probably seven, eight different lots, things are in Things are in uh, tanks, things are in small tanks, things are in um, barrels, things are in drums, um, and that's all put together in January. So things are pretty much on lees through, on the, on the lees through January, and then we bottle pretty quickly. So kind of, I love the snappiness of Sauvignon Blanc when it, when it's, it, when you're able to keep the, uh, the aromatics and the, marry those aromatics with the, the mouth feel to keep it. Again, there's that, you see what I mean by the, the, the smooth yet the bouncy at the same time, the smooth and the crisp at the same time. It's, maybe that's just the tension or the minerality or whatever it is, but. I like your use of the word alive. I think that describes it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's alive, it's bright. You have an un unorthodox use of wild yeast. This year I even used some, I used, I did one tank of fermentation for my rosé with wild yeast. And of course it's not just one yeast, <laughs> it's multiple strains and all sorts of stuff going on, which is where you try to work as, as hard as you can to make sure that the nutrition of the grape going into the tank for fermentation is, is perfect um, is, and adequate. Um, but I love that I seem to have discovered um, the way this particular vineyard uh, works well with barrel fermentation, wild yeast fermentation in barrel and small drum, and um, that that seems to layer in. It's, I, I use a second pick, a little riper pick to do that with this, and I, but I love the, the roundness. I mean, you just look at that whole idea of a barrel and how brilliant that design is just because of what it allows, you know, for contact with, you know, all of the flavor producing materials that are in grapes, you know, solids and grapes. And that just works very, very well for Sonia Blanc without getting too ponderous. I am definitely, and I think you would say, Truly, this is, this is not meant to be a Sauvignon Blanc that is trying to emulate a Chardonnay in any way. You know, I, Viva la Difference, you would say. Um, it really, it's really something that, you know, it's Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but it's not New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, that's for sure. Uh, it's, it just is a different, a different category. Unto its, unto its own. So some people will come and they'll say, just like for Zinfandel, they'll say, oh, you know, I've never really liked Sauvignon Blanc, but I like this. Or I've never really got Zinfandel. You know, I think Zinfandel is just usually too ripe for me or whatever, and then, oh, but I like this. So this happens a lot with the Sauvignon Blanc. And I think some people, they find that um, some of the other um, interpretations of grapes, because it's, or again, terroir, right? It's Trace de Boris, by the way, means three flavors in Spanish. The, for me, there are three flavors in every glass. The vine, in this case, Sauvignon Blanc. The terroir, the place. And then the good company around the glass. All three of those things are quite wonderful. I have the original label to show to you here. I don't know if you can see it better. I love your labels. Your labels are intriguing. A little bit of glare. I was pictures of the bottle and I found myself staring at the labels and okay, what's yeah. going on with this label? Because so, so this label is, you can see it's an old, it's a lithograph from, it's a triptych. It's a lithograph from out of an old page of what we think was an architectural manual uh, for, for draftsmen, for people who were studying. And this is from the 18, the late 1800s. And so it, um, I loved what I loved about, about this image, which we extracted, was that it looks like your, the perspective is that it looks like 
you're just about to step into a vineyard yourself. It's a little abstract, of course, but the whole idea is perspective is your own. That's something nobody can take away from you. Whether you're just starting out with, with drinking wine and still forming your own opinions about what you like and what you don't like or what you're willing to try, what you would prefer not to try, you know, if you're just starting to explore, that's your perspective that you're developing. And so whether you just say, this is a nice fruity red wine, or whether you say, well, I really like the structure and there's a lot of, there's a lot of elements that uh, of pomegranate and plum and, and dark, rich boysenberry. And maybe there's a little cardamom and a little star anise in there as well. You know, however you approach it, that's your perspective. This wine does have some structure. It has some grip. It has, it has a dialogue with your palate from the beginning to the sides, to the back, to the very end when you're still sipping on it. Um, you sip on it, you have a nice smell. It's meant to roll around a bit and to make your mouth water because it has some nice acidity. Yes, I love, I love that mouth watering. It's meant to have Zinfandel people give, don't give Zinfandel enough credit for being able to be really beautiful. And this is in this carnation, I will say this incarnation, this, this mode of saying Zinfandel can be very elegant and um, it doesn't have to be boisterous and loud and so, um, crazy with alcohol that that's about all that you get. Um, uh, you know, for your area, for the Arizona area, um, I, would, I would start every bottle of Zinfandel off cold or not, not cold, cold, but with a, a bead of sweat on it because it's gonna warm up in the glass and it's going to develop that way rather than bringing it out room temperature and where the alcohol stands out and it, it gives you less satisfaction. Zinfandel, because of so much fruit and a, a certain amount of grace in the finish, not harsh, um, it, can be, it can be wonderful in the summertime. It doesn't have the, at least the way I make it, it doesn't have the harsher tannins. And the way I do that is very specific. I don't crush it. So usually the process is of we're sorting, sorting grapes, I take the whole clusters, we're sorting them in the vineyard to begin with. When we're picking by hand, we're making, all of us are making selections. I'm telling, if I'm not actively picking, I'm telling the pickers, you know, don't pick that one or do, or I'll go through and be already sorting the clusters before they're picked. We bring them in, they're, they're sorted again on the sorting tape. They go through the destemmer, but they don't go through the crusher so that we don't, mechanically break down the membrane, the, the skin membrane. They drop into a three quarter ton bin, um, open top bin, and that's where the fermentation starts, either with cultured yeast or we wait and get native yeast going. And that can happen pretty well if the grapes are full of nutrition from the healthy soil, right? So, so the idea is to um, make part of this wine. Now I take eight acres and I pick it five different times because I, it gets ripe going up the slope. And so oh. there are so many different contributions to make to the structure and the grace of a wine like this. So this is 20 barrels put together, but um, it, they all have different wild yeast, native yeast, old barrel, new barrel, used barrel, um, you know, just just uh, just lots of things going on with this. And that's the idea. It's like there's lots of layers. And um, there are lots of possibilities for aging as a result. You go through the vineyards, you said five different times. That's incredible. And you're actually out there during the picking, directing Absolutely. which cluster. You, you've got nothing but love in every glass. I mean, this <laughs> Thank is you. Well, <laughs> Well, it starts with the rosé because we go in to two vineyards, um, the Petit Syrah vineyard that we use up in um, Calistoga uh, for rosé. And it also starts with 
all of our Zinfandel. We go through the entire Zinfandel vineyard, almost like a, a late green harvest. And we take off the shoulder of every cluster and put that into the rosé. So that's actually a sixth harvest. So it's a harvest that takes place about two to three weeks before we start to harvest the first of the, of the wines, of the grapes for red wine. We also are in a little alluvial fan. So there's a lot of deep soil in the middle, but there's not much soil at all in the edges. So we pick the edges before we pick the main body of the vineyard. So finding that out, finding, you know, and this would not be a question at all if one was talking about Burgundy or, you know, Cote Roti, you know, there are lots of little one acre or one hectare micro vineyards. And that's basically how we treat the entire property here, as small and tiny as it is, we make it into its own little micro subsets and pick according to that. And there's always, when you have an older vineyard there, there are always different expressions of that vineyard every year. So, you know, at this point we know it pretty well. Um, and we make certain, there's a time when Zinfandel, even though it, the grapes on any cluster, in any cluster you can get slightly underripe and slightly overripe, grapes and testing and, and pre-testing in your mouth and pre-testing with analysis to make sure that you're you're working with that. But in general, it ripens up the slope and it ripens up the side first and um, yeah, with rosé and then all the other picks. It, and then each of them come in and we have the time and the, and the focus to deal with that. So, um, yeah, if I have to say my, I, I, have to, I very quickly realized I had to be my own vineyard manager in order to make that work because the time of the pick in, is really crucial and we all pitch in, you know. Um, but to be that hands-on, is that unusual? Because I, I know a lot of times vineyard managers, you know, they might, they, they might coordinate the team to go out and start to uh, pick the clusters, but they're not going to go cluster by cluster. They're going to have them go through and, you know, pick all well, that's. You know, the most intense pick that we do is actually for rosé because we actually are every cluster making a decision about that cluster. Um, and then the Zinfandel once, once, and what that does is actually what we found is that that actually helps to balance out the, um, the fruit, balance out the cordon um, and help it in the next two or three or four or five weeks that it's going to be on the vine that it helps to uh, balance and, and, and equilibrate the energy in the vine. And that gets translated to the energy and the sugars and the fruit. And so I find that the vine sort of, once, once it gets, once we get the rosé off, the whole vineyard kind of goes, <sighs> okay. And then they have like another bead of, of it's like another bead added to the string of, of, of these multicolored, wonderful pearly beads. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great sort of thing to help the Zinfandel move to mature, move that take that last final step towards phenolic energy and, and pop, you know, just, okay, this is that farmer's market <laughs> tomato that's incredible and it's time to, time to, pick it, you know, that's, that's that sense, that morning that you taste this, you're testing the grapes and you, you, you taste that in the vine and you go, okay, because you've been tasting it and testing it for a couple, three weeks before that. And then that moment comes when it's like, boom, uh, that it's there. And then you have a range of, you know, it's not like, okay, the next minute you have to get the fruit off, but um, actually if it's 117 out, yes. Um, but, the, but the idea is you, you try to capture all those elements with how you treat it. And with hand macerating, then going in and mixing the grapes during fermentation by hand, a big potato masher essentially, by going in and mixing that, you still have some, berries, whole berries. So there is, there's part of the punch and the pop in this is a little carbonic maceration, a little whole berry fermentation. Um, I always find when we're putting at the end of fermentation and we're putting 
the, the then wine, almost wine in through the press that there are always a few whole berries that are left. And um, that's a wonderful part of this wine, I think. Really, really good part of this wine. So this Zinfandel has been in the bottle for a year now and it's just really starting to get to the point. This Zinfandel will last for 10 years, no problem. It's It just has that kind of pedigree and it has that kind of, again, I can't return to it enough, that stability of fruit and interest of fruit that starts to happen in the vineyard itself. Um, and this is all comes from the Rutherford estate. This is just right out my front door. <laughs> I feel sorry. It's nice. It's <laughs> nice to say that people have, I will say that people have had no sympathy for me. What? <laughs> right. It comes to um, saying, oh, well, how did you spend your COVID year? Well, you know, in the vineyard, you're like, Oh, and that's true. You know, with without anybody here, it was very lonely. The dogs were bored and they were a disaster. The dogs love being with people and um, it was a disaster for them. They're like, oh, now the inside of our door frames are all scratched. They're wanting to get out all the time to check and see if there are visitors here. They love having people here so much. But other than that, we're always entertained by the growing season goes on. It's like during fermentation, you always say, well, the yeast never sleep. <laughs> so um, you'd better be on top of your fermentations because the yeast never sleep. You're we are open now. Yes, we are with wide open arms. It's, it's, uh, we're trying to recapture some of the wonderful things that we can do here. We are all outside always outside anyway. In the heart, in the, in the winter time, we open up this cellar. Uh, we put on special lights and we put candles by the barrels and we have a couple of those inside the cellar where people can come during the winter time. But we're always outside under the um, 140 year old olives or out in our back patio or under our big um, 350 year old coast live oak. We often, people arrive with um, with, uh, you know, a great way to visit any wine region, of course, is to hire a driver. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're like, like, oh, are we there yet? It's, it's only a mile and a half off Highway 29 off of that corridor, but you, you would be pressed to hear it or see it or feel it and think that you're in any other place in the world than right here. Um, it, it has a um, it has a very special charm that is, and my job is to steward this. I don't, it, 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 my job is to steward this. My job is to be a good steward. This is your party in a bottle. This is my party in the bottle. <laughs> the Zinfandel, Zinfandel is my jazz club. This is my party in the bottle. And so this is Zinfandel, Cabernet, and Petite Syrah, all about 30, roughly 30%. And then the last little 1% is Petit Verdot that's quite fun because it adds a little magic and a little zip and a little density. Um, not to the extent that the Bordelais need it, for example, just because it's just kind of a nice little accent point. It's the, if you're looking at a stage full of dancers, it would be Petit Verdot would be the dancer that would be leaping across the stage every once in a while and then coming back again. It, that's what Petit Verdot sort of does in this bottle. But that's just to say it's the salsa party and it, and it is um, meant to be many people's Tuesday night wine, many people's luxury wine on a Saturday night with a friends and a wonderful steak or um, pizza. <laughs> there is a wide range uh, for this wine. Um, roasted quail with Moroccan spices, you know, that does very well. You're going to be in Morocco soon in November. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the um, Zinfandel Advocates and Producers, ZAP, <laughs> is full of love of Zin. And they have done, um, if people are interested, they can go online and they can see what ZAP is. They've got three or four trips now scheduled going forward. And we've been lucky enough to host one in the past uh, to Turkey, Turkey to Barcelona, Istanbul to Barcelona. And this time we're going into Casablanca and doing a round, round trip, road trip um, throughout Morocco. And Morocco has wineries. Um, wineries uh, from, 
I think for the most part, people from France who have beautiful Rhone estates have found an affinity for the soils, the terroir, and have been very successful uh, growing um, Rhone and, and European varieties, Southern European varieties uh, there. So we're gonna go, we're seeing five different wineries. We're all very excited. I'm excited about going to the spice, to the spice vendors in every town and trying to de develop my own Rosso Nude from each, each town we visit, each market we visit. But because there's nothing that wine like this or Zinfandel likes more than, oh gosh, something that has a little cumin and a little cardamom and a little uh, Aleppo and a, you know just a lot of stuff going on that's spicy and flavorful. And especially if you're drinking the wine young, which of course we mostly do these days, is drink a lot of wine young. So young, young wines need bold, spicy, lovely, um, you know, uh, pops and, and surprises of flavor and character as well. And you get that from having fresh spices and some creativity in, in your kitchen. Or even just simply throw some spices on a chicken and just go for it. It's easy. <laughs> So you produce quite a bit of this type of wine, don't you? What, like twelve? We produce more of. We've always produced more of this. Originally, my my um, idea, which was back in '99, was quite an unusual idea, I guess. Um, I hired three. I wasn't making wine. I had been doing the sales and marketing at Frog's Leap, and um, I wanted to take and explore the vineyard that I'd been living on since 87 at that point. So I'd been 12 years on this vineyard and I started to wonder more and more what's actually the character because Frog's Leap has always done a wonderful job taking three, two, three or four vineyards um, and blending them together and making a really beautiful wine. And that's what Zinfandel went into. Well, I asked three winemakers to join me and I had each of them make their own wine from the same grapes from our vineyard. And we sold them in three packs. So it was a taste, three tastes, tres sabores, three flavors, three tastes of terroir of the place. So a little bit before it's time, but we really did discover a lot about this particular vineyard and how to manage it and how to work with it. And, for example, just even in the use of barrel, which is really clear in, in this wine, how to balance the use of the barrel with the vibrancy of the fruit and not let the barrel overwhelm the fruit. Um, so that's really true with this, with this wine as, as well. Um, and the idea behind this wine is just, it's just so smooth and so easy sipping and just lots of fruit in the nose. But anyway, so, this wine came about because inevitably we had different amounts of wine left over every year. Mother Nature, you know, we'd say, okay, to one, one winemaker, that's your block and another block and another block. Nothing ever came in exactly the same. And so we had wine left over. So in 2000, I'm like, what are we gonna do with this extra wine? And they said, well, why don't you just blend it all together? Let's see what happens. Like, what are you gonna lose? And we all kind of went, well, why not? And then we all kind of went, well, Okay, no, why not? <laughs> why? Which of course is more, why wouldn't you? So we did that and think it would just be a one-off. In fact, um, the label is, is very much designed to one-off. It was a cocktail napkin that we embroidered. Oh. It was just a cocktail napkin, you know? And so this is pretty clear. Yeah. And it was awesome. fun and people loved it. And so we just kept doing it. So. At that time, remember in 2000, there weren't many blends, um, especially not here. And oh my gosh, the idea of blending Zinfandel and Cabernet, <laughs> basically unheard of. So Zinfandel and Petit Syrah, yes, ages old blend, but Cabernet and Petit Syrah, no, not, not so much. Um, all of them together, no, not so much at all. So it was really fun to be able to come up with something that was kind of a unique blend. Now there, of course, there are a lot of different variations on this theme, but we continued to produce this and, and because it's so popular and the price seems to be right for people, we've, 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 uh, we've taken this to the next level um, with respect to, I make twice as much of this as I make of any other wine.
what the wine club offers people um, is one, some, some discovery wines, because we do make some wine very small quantities just for our wine club, like Barbera and Cabernet Franc and Pic Pool, for example. And we also do offer some of the wines that my son makes, Carignan and Charbonneau, for example, to, to sort of spice up your day if you're into discovery and interest in wine. And, um, and you also, wine club members get first and last dibs on, on vintages. Um, but the other thing that uh, wine club does is, well, a couple of things. Um, it gives you, even if you're from out of state, it gives you an opportunity to send friends our way, friends, business people, anybody that you want to refer to be a member for a day on, on their membership. So we have a very liberal quarterly guest pass program. And then the third thing we do is members um, who are have some affiliation with nonprofits, um, we will join with them and make a small donation to the nonprofit, to the charity um, that they're working with. And so that kind of is a give back to the local community. Those, those things really work. So, and then of course we have the Palma annual pomegranate and paella party. And uh, I think at this point that's, that's become quite a perk for members because it, we're, we will have it again this year. And um, having missed out for the first time in many years last year, and we have a number of other special events that we do for, for members. So it's ultimately flexible. We make suggestions on a quarterly basis, um, three, six, or 12 bottles, uh, according to what tier people join in on. And then they have ultimate um, flexibility as to what they actually want to have show up in their back door, which is a great thing. It's a wonderful joy to open up a new bottle. Of, I don't belong to many wine clubs at all, but I love opening up a case of wine and seeing what's there. Um, some people order, if they're three bottle a quarter members, some people order three bottles of Port no every time. And that's just fine with us. That's just great. But um, there are lots of variations on the theme for what people can, can get from, um, from, uh, from a membership. And we enjoy having people being part of the family because that is when you have a very small winery and it's um, and you come here and you really do the ideas to, to try to help you feel part of the family. I don't know, <laughs> but that's, that's the basic, hopefully that's the idea.